Well, good evening, friends and neighbors. This is Harry Brown, and I'm so glad you tuned in. I hope you tuned in, and you're not just too too lazy to stand up and change the dial on your radio. But here we are for two hours of libertarian conversation, as we do every Saturday night. And I look at things from the standpoint that anything that increases our liberty is bound to make things better in society, and anything that increases the size, scope, and intrusions of government is bound to make things worse. Well, today is 9-11. As you well know, the third year anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And if you've been watching television today, especially the news channels, I'm sure you have seen quite a bit of coverage commemorating the third anniversary of the attacks. But I would be quite surprised if any time during the day you heard anybody discuss American foreign policy as a potential cause of the 9-11 attacks. No, I think even if you saw some retrospective footage of people reacting to the attacks. All you saw was they hate our freedom, they hate our democracy, they hate our prosperity. And they are just fanatics. No one discussing whether or not America's foreign policy had anything to do with it. Well, on September 11th, 2001, almost as soon as I heard that there were such attacks, I'm a late sleeper, I get up in the early afternoon when I'm at home and go to bed in the wee small hours of the morning. And on that day, my wife came and woke me up, I don't know what time, 10 or 11, 12 o'clock, in the morning, and I got up, watched a little on television, and then I sat down and wrote an article, which appeared the following day on World News Daily. And World News Daily is a very conservative outfit, but they were very nice to allow me to publish that article the day after 9-11, and to publish quite a few articles in a series from then on, covering a libertarian viewpoint of what had happened. And I'd like to begin tonight by just reading that article to you. It's very short, so... The fact that I'm reading it should not be a problem. It was entitled, When Will We Learn? The terrorist attacks against America comprise a horrible tragedy, but they shouldn't be a surprise. It is well known that in war the first casualty is truth, that during any war truth is forsaken for propaganda. But sanity was a prior casualty. It was the loss of sanity that led to war in the first place. And our foreign policy has been insane for decades. It was only a matter of time until Americans would have to suffer personally for it. And it is a terrible tragedy of life that the innocent so often have to suffer for the sins of the guilty. When will we learn that we cannot allow our politicians to bully the world without someone bullying back eventually? President Bush has authorized continued bombing of innocent people in Iraq. President Clinton bombed innocent people in the Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Serbia. President Bush Sr. invaded Iraq and Panama. President Reagan bombed innocent people in Libya and invaded Grenada, and on and on it goes. Did we think the people who lost their families and friends and property in all that destruction would love America for what happened? When will we learn that violence always begets violence? Supposedly, Reagan bombed Libya to teach Muammar Gaddafi a lesson about terrorism. But shortly thereafter, a Pan-American plane was destroyed over Scotland, and our government is convinced it was Libyans who did it. When will we learn that teaching someone a lesson never teaches anything but resentment, that it only inspires the recipient to greater acts of defiance? How many times on Tuesday did we hear someone describe the terrorist acts as cowardly acts? But as misguided and despicable as they were, they were anything but cowardly. The people who committed them knowingly gave their lives for whatever stupid beliefs they held. But what about the American presidents who order bombings of innocent people while the presidents themselves remain completely insulated from any danger? What would you call their acts? When will we learn that forsaking truth and reason in the heat of battle almost always assures that we will lose the battle? And now, as sure as night falls day, we will be told we must give up more of our freedoms to avenge what never should have happened in the first place. When will we learn that it makes no sense to give up our freedoms in the name of freedom? So what should be done? First of all, stop the hysteria. Stand back and ask how this could have happened. Ask how a prosperous country isolated by two oceans could have so embroiled itself in other people's business that someone would want to do us harm. Even sitting in the middle of Europe, Switzerland isn't beset by terrorist attacks because the Swiss mind their own business. Second, resolve that we won't let our leaders use this occasion to commit their own terrorist attacks upon more innocent people, foreign and domestic, that will inspire more terrorist attacks in the future. Third, find a way with enforceable constitutional limits to prevent our leaders from ever again provoking this kind of anger against America. Now, there are those who will say that this article is unpatriotic and un-American, that this is not a time to question our country or our leaders. When will we learn that without freedom and sanity, 
There is no reason to be patriotic. End of the article. Well, as you can imagine, the article provoked quite a bit of reaction, uh, quite a bit of criticism. In fact, over the next week or so, I received actually over a thousand emails. I have never been so inundated with emails in my life, even including all the emails about Viagra and somebody in an African country wanting to cut me in on a big multi-million dollar business deal. Even counting all those these days, I still don't get emails the way I did three years ago. And there were quite a few criticisms. There were also quite a few people uh, complimenting me on the article. In fact, it probably ran about 50-50. But after we take our first break, what I would like to do is to go over some of the criticisms that were made and my response to those criticisms, because those criticisms are still being made today. Only they're not framed as criticisms. They are just simply offered as slogans for why we should be supporting our great leader and why we should be doing this or doing that and why we should bomb those people over there into oblivion. In any event, whatever the particular proposal, I'll cover a few of these when we come back from the break because, as I say, I think they're still relevant today and I think it's important to address these criticisms and to find answers for them. This is Harry Brown. I'm so glad you tuned in tonight. And we don't have to focus this entire show on 9-11. There are happier things we can talk about, and we will before the show is over. So stay tuned. Here are some of the reactions I got to my article, When Will We Learn? And before I give them to you, let me mention that actually there were four articles in the series. The second and third articles responded to criticisms that were made. And then the fourth article identified a fatal flaw that I believe is in the heart of the desire for retaliation that... We are turning the matter over to the government, and the government never does anything right. So there were four articles in the series, When Will We Learn? And then there were three articles in a series, What Should We Do About Terrorism? And you can read all of these articles if you like. Just go to my website, harrybrown.org, and right at the top of the home page, you'll see Radio Links page. Just click on that, and under today's date, you'll see links to those two series. Harrybrown.org is the name of the website. All right, first criticism. This was a bad time for you to say I told you so in such a poor fashion. Well, my reply was, I'm not saying I told you so. I'm trying to stop future madness against Americans and against foreigners. Should I wait until after our military invades Afghanistan before speaking out? Of course, right now, that seems like a very dated reply, because then when our military did invade Afghanistan, the argument was, well, our country is at war now. You shouldn't be speaking out against our government during a time of war. Next criticism. Now of all times is the time when we must support one another for the best. And I replied by saying that doesn't mean supporting the ill-conceived policies that led to this event. And in a similar way, somebody else wrote, It is time for our people to pull together against these sick terrorists. We could use your help, too. I reply, My help to do what? Encourage our politicians to continue doing the very things that led to this? You're demonstrating why I had to write the article. If we stand behind our leaders now, letting them speak for us as one voice... Nothing will change. We will continue to see more acts by our government that lead to more terrorist acts on the U.S. Someone else wrote, Don't tell me to stop the hysteria. This event merits hysteria, anger, sadness, and fear. I will be hysterical because it is is the only thing I can do to show my countrymen that I mourn them. My reply, Hysteria creates lynch mobs and more killing of innocent people. Grief, anger, and resentment are all natural reactions to what happened. But letting your emotions make bad decisions is not a productive reaction. Next one. What's done is done, and now we're in the middle of this terrible mess. Maybe you're right. Maybe we should not be surprised that something was bound to happen. But now what? We don't need people criticizing our past mistakes at this moment. Save that for later. Right now we need immediate action. And I replied, if we don't understand the past mistakes, the immediate action taken will simply repeat those mistakes. Is that what you want? And it's interesting that the writer of the criticism said, Save that for later. Well, George Bush has as much as told us that we will be involved in this war on terrorism for the rest of our lives. So I'm supposed to make my remarks from the grave, I guess. Another letter. You have lost my support by your political posturing in a time of crisis. And I replied, political posturing? Do you really think I expected to receive adulation for writing an article that goes so sharply against current public opinion? And another one, similar, it sickens me that you would use this tragedy this way. I replied, in what way? To try to stop it from happening again? To try to stop our politicians from running off and bombing more innocent people? As a normally public voice, should I sit quietly by and not point out that our politicians are continually putting innocent Americans in arms way by terrorizing innocent foreigners? I understand your outrage and emotional reaction, but we must hold our own politicians accountable for the anger they are causing around the world with their careless, dangerous, show-off tactics. 
And then, of course, the inevitable. Please leave the United States. You do not deserve to remain here with this type of un-American diatribe, which only serves to support the voices of moderation. And I replied, I thought this was supposed to be a free country in which everyone was allowed to speak his mind. I guess I misunderstood. I didn't realize it was a crime to try to stop a lynching. And someone wrote, using this event as a means to bolster the Libertarian Party is despicable, and it is disgusting. My reply, it appears that standing up for what one believes isn't a way to bolster the popularity of the Libertarian Party. But that's what Libertarians often do, especially when no one else will. Another one, you have end, forever ended any chance of my supporting the Libertarian Party unless you resign from any and all liber leadership positions immediately. To which I replied, you'll be pleased to know that I don't hold any leadership position in the Libertarian Party. I am a private citizen who grieves for what the politicians have done to my country and to the innocents who die in America and abroad. In fact, many Libertarians disagree with my position. So don't judge the Libertarian Party by me. And then the inevitable recall, uh, request for retaliation. We must deter the next attack with the fiery sword of vengeance. Not some limp liberal, why can't we be left alone, weak response. And I replied, we have done that already. Bombing Libya, invading Panama, bombing a pharmaceutical factory in the Sudan, bombing Afghanistan. Did those fiery swords of vengeance deter the next attack? And then bomb Kabul into oblivion. Replying, as I recall, Kabul is the capital of Afghanistan, which is run by the same freedom fighters to whom our government gave so much money and military hardware in the 1980s. Before we run off bombing innocent people, or is every Afghan guilty of the World Trade Center bombing, shouldn't we question the American foreign policy that put those people in power in Afghanistan, or is it bad timing to bring that up now? Another criticism, once you know the face of your enemy, destroy him completely and you will never need fight him again. America is at war. To win a war, it must be fought in totality. I reply, a war against whom? Against people like the one million Iraqis who have died of starvation or disease because of the American blockade? Against people like the innocents who died in the bombings of the Sudan and Afghanistan? Every time our leaders say we must make sure this will never happen again, they do something to assure that it will happen again. I wrote my article in the vain hope it might help people to think twice before demanding the wrong action. Well, the remainder of the criticisms that I'll cite now are just those that really still apply today. And I think that it's important to deal with these criticisms. Here's one, for instance. Do you think these terrorists can really be reasoned with? I hear that a lot now today whenever anybody suggests anything other than trying to bomb them into submission. And, of course, my answer is I didn't say they could be reasoned with. I said we shouldn't give them legitimate reasons to direct their misguided zeal at the United States. And a similar question, don't you think a soft response would just encourage more terrorism? My reply, I hope the people who were involved are found, tried, and punished. I don't consider that a soft response, but I don't want any more innocent people hurt, Americans or foreigners. And then another one, which still comes up, you totally lost your credibility with me when you suggest that any military response will basically serve no purpose. And my response was, the United States went to Vietnam to stop the communist dominoes from falling, and the entire region fell to the communists. The U.S. invaded Panama, supposedly to end drug dealing there, and today Panama is more overrun with the drug trade than ever. After years of arming Saddam Hussein, the U.S. invaded Iraq to get rid of him, but he is still held up as a terrible threat to the world. The U.S. bombed Libya to teach terrorists a lesson, so Libyan terrorists exploded a bomb on a Pan-American plane over Scotland. Perhaps you could give me an example of where United States military response in the past several decades has achieved any purpose. Obviously, the individuals involved in the attack should be found, prosecuted, and punished. But going to war against another country or against some vague conspiracy will solve no more than the examples I just gave. And here's a very important one. I don't mind giving up some more of my liberty in order to put a stop to these despicable acts. My reply, I understand your sentiments, but I respectfully disagree with them for two reasons. First, you have no idea what liberties are going to be taken from you. And whatever they are, you can have no expectation of ever getting them back, even if the underlying problem goes away completely. For just one obvious example, income tax withholding was instituted as a war measure in 1942, and it is still with us today. Second, taking away our liberties rarely achieves the goals used to justify the new oppression. Because of the drug war, our government now rummages through your bank records, looking for suspicious transactions you may have entered into. You and your property can be searched and seized without a warrant, without being convicted of anything, without even being accused of anything. And yet drugs are as widespread today as when these intrusions were put in place 20 years ago. It's easy to say you support intrusions that you believe aren't likely to affect you personally. But I can assure you that any invasion of civil liberties will affect you more than they do the truly guilty, because the truly guilty will quick, quickly learn about the invasions and how to circumvent them. 
And another question, uh, which comes up very frequently. Isn't it occasionally right to intervene on the behalf of people that are being massacred, such as in Serbia? My reply, in a free country, you should be free to send money or even yourself to any country in the world to aid any cause you believe in. Incidentally, that isn't completely legal under federal law today. You're not free to send money or even yourself to any country in the world to aid any cause you believe in. But the American government shouldn't use your money to intervene or stir up resentments for causes you may not believe in. Another one, uh, which was very similar, was the world is our business. We all live here. Should people be suffering in East Timor or Iraq or Ethiopia, and we just stand by and let it happen if we can do something? I don't think so. Taking more responsibility for all the people of this planet and all the nations of the world would be a better stance. My reply, that should be your choice. You should be free to help anyone anywhere in the world. But our politicians should not have the power to inflict violence on people in other countries in your name, making you a target of retribution. And then this one, which still comes up. We are a world power, and we must act like one. This means being unpopular. This means intervening in the world, because we have a responsibility to the world. My reply, and it means having people attack us violently, no matter how many security measures are taken, and no matter how many liberties you give up. Is that what you want? Well, as I said, I had two articles full of these various criticisms that were leveled and my replies to them. And these, I call them criticisms, but actually they are just the slogans or the stances that are repeated over and over again and still being repeated today. People want to believe that their government is doing the right thing. And of course, if they're members of or supporters of the Republican Party, then they don't even think about it. They just know that they must support a Republican president in whatever he does. But, uh, but by the day after 9-11, or even the week after 9-11, uh, George Bush had not really made it fully clear what he was going to do, so most of these arguments were from the heart, from people, that they really believed this. They weren't just mouthing uh, party opinions. And it is unfortunate. It's unfortunate that Americans are not taught the history of American foreign policy. That's why, as I said last week, Rush Limbaugh can get away with saying America was minding its own business before 9-11. Who was to contradict him? Who had learned in school of any of the things that have happened over the last 50 or 60 years that have been instigated by our foreign policy, by the CIA, by the military? Who in America actually knows that there are, are 702 foreign military bases of the United States in about 100 countries around the world? Who could possibly know any of these things if he hadn't been taught it in school. No, unfortunately, as I've said so many times, one of the worst mistakes, if not the worst mistake, made in American history was in letting government educate our children. We got a very good question by email from a listener in Ohio who wants to know what a libertarian president would have done on 9-11. What would have happened if we had elected a libertarian president in 2000? But we're going to save that for the beginning of the next hour, because right now we've got a number of phone calls, and we like to see what the real people of the world have to say. All right, let's go now to New Mexico and talk with Al. Good evening, Al. Hi, a great show, and Thank great you. articles, um, and a great book, too. Um, right now you're discussing one of the only issues where I don't agree with you entirely. Um, I read your article three years ago. I actually couldn't finish it because I was too emotional, but uh, at that time, I didn't write you off because you'd proven me wrong so many times before. So I went back a few months ago, and I ended up agreeing with most of what you said. But where I do not agree with you is that I think that the invasion of Afghanistan and the overthrow of the Taliban was necessary to prevent further terrorist attacks. Well, a lot of innocent people got killed in Afghanistan, and right. it, of course, undoubtedly uh, increased the ranks of people around the world who were willing to support the terrorists with money and networking and other contacts. And that's the real problem. There will always be thugs in the world. Right. But the question is, are the good people of the world going to support those thugs? And we would say right off the bat, of course good people wouldn't support thugs. But there were an awful lot of good Germans who supported Hitler because okay. of what had happened to the Germans at the end of World War One and the way they were humiliated. And there are a lot of good people around the world who are supporting the terrorists because they are just absolutely fed up with American troops in their country, with American officials helping to overthrow democratic governments and install brutal dictators who happen to say, I'm against communism, right. and things of this sort. And uh, invading Afghanistan or invading Iraq is just simply going to right. increase the ranks of those people. Well, I, I, uh, I agree with you on Iraq entirely. Um, just that Afghanistan had terrorist infrastructure that I thought needed to be destroyed, and I think that, um, that what we're doing in Iraq is doing a lot to uh, increase the terrorism around the world. But I think and if Afghanistan if we hadn't struck, I think they would have kept striking us until we had finally uh, hit back. But wouldn't it be better if we just simply change the policy that makes those people after us in the first place? If you have more to say, hang on, Al. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Let's uh, continue our conversation with Al in New Mexico. Al, did you have a further point you wanted to make? Uh, I just wanted to follow up uh, and say that I agree with you that our politicians give people otherwise would never be hostile towards this incentive to kill our civilians. But 
just in that one case of Afghanistan, that's, uh, I think that was uh, the only place where, where I disagree with you, where I think we did need to go in, we did need to depose the Taliban, their, infrastru- their terrorist infrastructure. Well, and, um, a lot of people agree with you. A lot of people say we should never have gone into Iraq, but of course, right. going into Afghanistan was the proper. Uh, so you're not alone in that view. I don't happen to agree with it. I don't see right. that Americans going in and killing innocent people can help anything. And uh, killing ten innocent people in order to catch one terrorist is not a good bargain. But thank you for your thoughts, Al. I appreciate it. And let's talk now with Chandra in Utah. Good evening, Chandra. Hi, Harry. Um, I just found your show tonight, and I'm enthralled. Thank you. It's so wonderful. It's like a breath of fresh air. Well, thank you. And I hope you uh, tune in each week from now on. Oh, I will. No more dates on Saturday night. Stay home and listen to Harry Brown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Um, in regards to your last caller, um, just as to invading Afghanistan, you know, we're the ones who created that terrorist infrastructure there in the first place to fight the um, Soviet. Yes, uh, very definitely, and it's a, you're making a point I should have brought up in uh, the conversation with Al, but that is so typical, too, that what happens is we go in to fix some problem, and we create another problem that is equally as bad and sometimes much, much, much worse. Exactly. We liberated uh, the... Supposedly, we were supposedly going to liberate Europe uh, in World War II, and half of Europe wound up under the thrall of the Soviets, and so much of American resources, military weapons, and so forth had been given to the Soviets during the war that they were built up. And the result was that instead of a four-year World War II, we were involved in a 50-year, almost 45-year Cold War that kept Americans scared to death that they were going to die in a nuclear attack all that time, and it's hard to see how that was an improvement. And I should not say we did this and we did that, because I do not believe it was we. I believe it was they. It was the politicians that did it, not you and I and other Americans. Uh, Chandra, I'm sorry this was a short segment. If you have anything more to say, please stay on the line during the news, and we'll finish this conversation right after the news. And don't you go away, folks, because we got another hour to go. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned. Harry Brown here, and we still have almost another hour to go. And I think we need to clear up some unfinished business. I believe Chandra is still on the line, so let's uh, see what further Chandra, Chandra has to say tonight. You with us, Chandra? I am. Okay. Hi. What, did, was there something you wanted to add? Um, yeah, uh, just as a 20-year-old who completely agrees with your um, opinion on foreign policy, the, uh, the upcoming draft le- legislation has been really concerning me. Do you have any ideas on what we can do to, that, to stop that before it passes? Well, there really isn't much you can do about such an issue because it hasn't been made a public issue, so it's hard for people to take you seriously. Right, whenever I speak to people about that, they... They brush it off as yeah, if, oh, oh, it'll no. never happen. Yeah, they wouldn't do that. Right. Uh, but I think it's important to point out in situations like that, well, after 9-11, who would have believed that security would be so tight at airports? Who would have believed that they would pass a law like the Patriot Act, which would allow them to monitor your emails exactly. and to put on wiretaps without a warrant and uh, things of this sort, that we need to recognize that as long as this war goes on and it is not, win, uh, not won because the terrorists continue to exist and problems continue to erupt around the world, even if not in the United States, then our government is just going to take more oppressive measures and more oppressive measures in the name of trying to win this war. And conscription is definitely something that politicians traditionally turn to. And especially in the situation in Iraq where they're talking about the fact that they've depleted the National Guard in this country and governors of states are complaining that National Guard troops are not available to help in the event of fires, earthquakes, uh, hurricanes, and so forth that there will be a lot of pressure brought to to bring about a draft and a lot of supposedly logical reasons advanced for it. So we need to be prepared for it. And I would just uh, call into talk shows whenever you can and bring it up, talk shows where the host doesn't necessarily agree with you, but even those cases where the host might but has not made an issue of this. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Chandra, and keep listening. I said earlier that at the start of this hour, I would address the question of what would a libertarian president have done, and I want to do that before we go back to the phones. In the first place, let's just, I was the libertarian candidate in 2000, so I will take it upon myself to say what I would have done. And I have to say that I cannot speak for all libertarians, so a different libertarian running for president might have a different approach to it. But first of all, even by some miracle, no libertarian could have been elected president in 2000 unless he had been in the debates. And if he had been in the debates, there is no question that issues of foreign policy would have come up. And at that point, I, as a libertarian presidential candidate, would certainly have made the point that we should not be in foreign countries, that we should end all aid to dictators and democracies alike, that Americans should be free to go fight if they want to in foreign battles. They should be free to send money to any country in the world, to any 
government in the world to any revolutionary movement in the world, but that our government should get out of this, we should bring all the troops home, and that if I, somehow I am elected president, this is one of the first things I will do. And in the inaugural address, I would have reiterated this and said that starting tomorrow morning, we are withdrawing our troops from around the world. It was a mistake to put them there. They have caused more harm than good, and we are going to correct that mistake now. And if the troop withdrawals actually began, I believe that 9-11 never would have happened. It isn't that people like Osama bin Laden and others who join with him aren't natural-born thugs who are looking for trouble, but they're going to find trouble where people support them, where they can get the money to do the things they need to do to stir up trouble, where they can get the contacts, where they can uh, get the help and the supplies. I mean, the people who were here in the United States and got on those planes had to have a great deal of support from a great deal, a great many people, not just over in the Arab countries, but here in the United States to help them with logistics. And the point is, that once they saw that the United States no longer provided a legitimate reason for people to strike out at the United States, they would have turned their anger elsewhere, or they might have even given up and gotten jobs at McDonald's. I don't know. So I think it is very unlikely that 9-11 would have happened. But suppose it happened anyway. I would reiterate the fact that we were withdrawing from the rest of the world. We were no longer telling the rest of the world what it can do. But we are also not going to sit and take it when something like this happens any more than we would let a murder in New York City or Charlotte, North Carolina, or anywhere else go unpunished, although that would be a local matter, not a federal matter. And so we would do everything possible to find those who had perpetrated this act, try to extradite them to the United States, and in the process then put them on trial and uh, if found guilty, then to punish them accordingly. And that we would do this, but we are not going to make matters worse by going around killing innocent people, even though that is collateral damage and never intended. And our government, of course, does not go out to kill innocent people the way terrorists do. But innocent people still get killed, and it doesn't make any difference to their families that the United States government didn't intend to kill them. So there would have been no invasion of Afghanistan. There would have been no invasion of Iraq. Instead, there would have been a concerted effort with all the resources that were available for those two invasions being put instead to ferreting out where and who the people are who had committed these acts. Now, I did get a question already by email from Adam, who, in reading my series, What Can We Do About Terrorism, says the first part says that, quote, if some of them, meaning the perpetrators of terrorism, are located in foreign countries, our government should request extradition, unquote. Theoretically, that seems like a good idea, but what if we do, but what do we do if that government refuses to extradite? Well, it's too bad, but the answer is not to go in and start bombing that country and killing a lot of innocent people. There is no perfect solution. Once you have created a problem, such as our government created over 55 years of messing in other countries' affairs and imposing dictators upon other countries and oppressing people and aiding it and aiding in the, in the killing of innocent people around the world, there is no easy way out of it. And I would rather that the perpetrators of 9-11 go free than the, that the United States government engage in more killing of innocent people around the world. I think that uh, a lot of diplomatic pressure would be brought upon those countries to extradite, even Afghanistan under the Taliban and others, because of the worldwide revulsion of what had happened, especially in the face of an American president saying, we are no longer going to mess with other countries and we hope that other countries will... Uh, reciprocate by not messing with the United States. But I emphasize again that you should not evaluate these alternative ideas on the basis, are they perfect, when it's obvious that what our government is doing now is far from perfect. A thousand Americans have been killed. Ten thousand Iraqis have been killed. And Osama bin Laden is still sitting somewhere around the world safe and sound. So obviously this system hasn't worked, so we can't expect any alternative ideas to be perfect and to work automatically. All right, we'll go back to the phones when we return. If you want to call, it's 1-800-259-9231. 1-800-259-9231. This is Harry Brown. And now we'll go to Clymer, New York, and talk with Roger. Good evening, Roger. Well, good evening, Harry. Thanks for taking my phone call. Well, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting so long. Oh, well, that's fine. I wanted to say uh, Mr. Pat Buchanan was, was uh, plugging his book, Where the Right Went Wrong, on TV. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it was is well, he was sitting there trying to discuss why we shouldn't be in the Middle East, you know, with, you know, getting in between Israel and the other countries. And, and Nick Gingrich was on, you know, that wonderful patriot who, when it was his chance to serve during the Vietnam War, made sure he got out of it. Uh, he says, well, well, he's making up for that today by getting as many people to go to war as possible against Iraq. Uh, right. So he, we should forgive him. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, as long as it's not his own skin. Uh, and, you know, anyway, he says, well, we have to be over there. You know, otherwise, all that oil would be controlled by all those dictators over there, and, and we would be looking at $200 a barrel oil. <laughs> and I, I sat there, I says, well, aren't we looking at $200 a barrel oil? oil now, take the cost, and then take the cost of all our troops being over there. 
Yeah, it would be great if somebody, maybe at the Cato Institute or somewhere else, could come up with at least an estimate of just exactly how much we are paying for oil now if you factor in the military costs that have been uh, uh, incurred in order to try to protect the oil supply. Obviously, as I've said before, this is what the oil companies should do. The oil companies should go out and get the oil, and if they have to pay to protect the oil supply in some way or other by arming their tankers or whatever they'd have to do to protect it, then that would be factored into the cost, and we would know how much it costs for a barrel of oil. This way we don't know. All we know is that the nominal price is around $45 a barrel now, but the real price, as you're pointing out, could be $100. It might even be $200 a barrel. And, of course, the fallacy in all of this business of protecting the oil supply is that if we didn't go over there and shoot up a bunch of people, they wouldn't sell us the oil. Well, what are they going to do with the oil if they don't sell it to us? What are they going to do, light fires with it? Are they going to have ceremonies, uh, uh, ancient sacred rites of lighting the oil fields up or something? Of course not. The only way that that wealth is of any value to them is if they sell the product of it to people like us and other people around the world. So the oil supply does not need to be protected because the dictators who control that oil are going to do everything possible to make sure that that oil is available to us. Well, but also, it's nice to know that certain things don't change. <laughs> uh, but, but like what? Like what? Well, okay. Um, we got into World War One. It was so tragic with the casualties that Woodrow Wilson says we need a League of Nations, more government to prevent this war. Well, that kind of collapsed as it should have, but then we get World War II. Oh, my God, we need another, more government, the United Nations. And, and we notice how good the United Nations has prevented war for all these years. You know, we've got the Korean conflict and the Vietnamese war and, the, and these uh, all these Wars around the world. Yeah, and it's interesting that the United States was one of the prime movers to establish the United Nations. It was a pet project of Roosevelt, and the the uh, negotiations to create the United Nations were held in San Francisco, uh, Alger Hiss being the chief American representative. But America was 100% behind the United Nations and was trying to get the Soviet Union and all these other countries to join in. And so where are we today after that great promise of peace uh, that the United Nations would bring? Our president says our decisions will never be made by any foreign countries. We will make our own decisions. Decisions. In other words, the United Nations can go, well, what's, what's the polite word of saying it? It um, can go fudge. Yeah, yeah, I guess that is the correct. But, see, but the beauty of it is, is now with this 9-11 commission, I mean, it's more government. More government. What's the solution, even though of government course. has failed? More of government. Course. I mean, it's just nice to know that, you know, as long as people in government sit there and say, well, no matter what, the answer is always more government. I, absolutely. Every failure of government is used as an excuse for more government. The schools are doing a terrible job, so we need more government, more federal regulation, more money for education. Uh, the war on drugs is being lost, so we need more government. We need more rules. We need more intrusions in individuals' lives. Our, our government failed to protect us on 9-11, therefore we need more government. And you're right. And it's the same thing with regulation. Every time there's a plane crash, uh, which fortunately does not happen too often, but it's always used as an excuse that we need to beef up the federal regulatory agency that failed to prevent the crash in the first place. Uh, that isn't what happens in the free market. Somebody fails. Somebody makes a big mistake. Uh, they don't produce any more Edsels then. Uh, they don't sell any more new Coke. Uh, the product that was such a disaster goes out of business. It doesn't get a bigger budget. Anyway, you get the point. Thanks so much for your comments, uh, Roger. Always glad to hear from you. And uh, let's go now to Massachusetts and talk with Kayleen. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello, my esteemed Mr. Brown. Uh, I'm glad uh, you're with us. I'm sorry that we had to keep you waiting so long. That's all right. It's, um, all, it's all the engineer's fault, not my, not my talking. <laughs> First of all, um, I want you to know that I agree with everything that you say about what happened on 9-11. And um, you've heard the song, 15 Candles. Well, I happen to have 30 candles burning tonight, one for each hundred people who died on 9-11-2001 in mourning. Uh, that is a tradition of mine now. Uh, and <clears throat> it's just unbelievable how our government has just thinking, they're thinking that they're the world police. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you about um, why 9-11 happened. Um, well, we've got to make sure somehow that it doesn't happen again, and that absolutely. starts with us raising as much hell as we can and hoping that finally people get the point. And then when they do, we've got to get some kind of enforceable way of preventing them and from creating those same conditions before, again. Before before the break, can I just say that I read the uh, the letter at the end of your book, Why Government Doesn't Work, uh -huh. your beautiful wife, Pamela, mm -hmm. and it absolutely depicts you. You are such a beautiful person and a wonderful gentleman. Well, I thank you. Well, thank you, Kayleen. I appreciate that. We will be back right after the break, folks. Stay tuned. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. And before we go back to the phones once again, uh, something Kayleen said reminded me 
when she spoke of the 3,000 lives. Uh, just, what would it be, yesterday, Donald Rumsfeld spoke at the National Press Club. And in answer to a question, he said that he believes what the United States is doing is worth it in terms of the costs of the money and the lives lost. He believes it is worth it. In other words, it is a, a good bargain for what we are accomplishing that we have lost so many lives and spent so much money on it. Uh, I just, the first thing that I thought of, and I wish that somebody would ask there, and of course nobody would ask, is, well, what exactly has it cost you, Mr. Rumsfeld? Uh, did you die in Iraq? Did your children, any of your children die? Any of your grandchildren die? Uh, what exactly has it cost you? Are you being searched at airports when you fly someplace? Are you having to go through metal detectors everywhere? Are you having your phone monitored or your email monitored or any of these things? What exactly has it cost you, Mr. Rumsfeld, that you are willing to pay in order to get whatever it is you think has been accomplished in Iraq? This reminds me of when Madeleine Albright was asked a question. I forget what show it was on. I think it was Meet the Press. During the 1990s, as you may be aware, at the end of the Iraq War, sanctions were imposed upon Iraq, which kept the Iraqis from even in importing food and medicines. And this continued over the years, and it was enforced by U.S. bombing of the country. Anytime planes tried to get out, they were shot down, and in other ways, the United States enforced this embargo on Iraq. Most people don't know that this was going on throughout the 1990s. Hundreds of thousands of people died of starvation and of lack of medical care. And when Madeleine Albright was asked about this on one of the national shows, again, I believe it was Meet the Press, she was asked the question that in view of the fact that so many people have died, do you believe this was a good policy? And she said, in view of what we are trying to accomplish, yes, we believe it is worth it. In other words, to her, the cost of all those Iraqis dying was a small price to pay for God knows what it was she thought she was accomplishing, because... A few years later, the President of the United States thought it was necessary to go in and actually invade the country. So how much good did all those sanctions do? How much good did it do to kill all those innocent men, women, and children? And the third question that occurs to me, having to do with cost, 3,000 Americans died on 9-11. The United States has been pursuing a foreign policy for, for now for almost 50 years, but at the time it had been, pardon me, it's now almost 60 years, but at the time it was 56 years. And this policy was to inflict the view of the United States government on foreign countries around the world. In the way that Rumsfeld and Madeleine Albright and George Bush and all these other people expressed things, the 3,000 people who died on 9-11 were merely a cost that had to be incurred in order for the United States to pursue the foreign policy that it has for the last half century and that it continues to pursue today. So why don't any of these people like Donald Rumsfeld or George Bush or Colin Powell or Paul Wolfowitz or any of these people refer to the 3,000 people who died on 9-11 as a cost of the necessity of America being the world's policeman and imposing its way upon the rest of the world? But that's exactly what it is. And you know something? I think the cost is way too large and the benefits are way too few. In fact, I have yet to see any benefit from it and I have seen a tremendous cost. All right. Let's talk now with Chuck in California. Good evening, Chuck. Hello, Harry. How are you this evening? Just fine. How about yourself? I'm just dandy. What's on your mind? Well, I'd like to tell you what I would have done if I had been president after 9-11. All right. Uh, in the words of, like, um, John Kennedy, I would have made a, I would make a statement to the world, let the words go forth to all nations, friend and foe alike, that the United States is going to honor all of its present alliances for the next six months, at which time they will end. All foreign aid will stop. I will be removing all troops from every nation in the world, even if I have to do nothing but house them in the United States, but likely I would furlough them, with the money that I saved by moving the troops in and the reduction in the elimination of, men, of um, foreign aid. Half of it I would return to the people of the United States as a tax credit, which would probably cause such an abundance in the nation <clears throat> that we would need those troops home to fill the jobs that would have to be created. I would break off all alliances, and I would announce to the world that the money that we're going to be saving, we're going to be putting into a defense system that is going to be so state-of-the-art, so cutting-edge, so high-tech, that if anyone were to try to attack us again, that would we, be, we would be able to smell our way back to them. And you're talking about national defense rather than national exactly. offense. In fact, I, I'm, I was going to say that to divert all money that's being spent on offensive weapons to defensive weapons. In fact, yeah. I might even take a page out of your book and say, offer a reward to companies that could come up with defensive systems that would that would make us safer. Yes. 
Can you imagine what could be done with the four or five hundred billion dollars that's currently being spent on offensive capabilities? Being wasted. Um, yeah, being wasted on it. Uh, right. Can you imagine if you plowed all of that into we'll finding ways of better defending this country? We uh, will. How airtight you could make it, but you would, as you, you pointed out, you wouldn't need that much money if your concern is defense. It's when we are trying to be offensive that it seems to be that we need four or five hundred billion dollars. You could defend this country uh, very, very well for probably fifty billion dollars a we year. We would literally have a system. That would smell it way back to the origin of any attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. The only thing I ask, wonder about is why you say it's six months. Uh, because well, you know, there there have been people that are depending upon us now. Like, say, for instance, Israel. Israel right. probably is life probably dependent on our support. Okay, hang on, Chuck, hang on, Chuck, while we take this okay. break, and uh, we'll get the rest of your thoughts then. Uh, this is Harry Brown. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. The phone number is one eight hundred two five nine nine two three one. Stay tuned. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. We're talking with Chuck in California. And I see what you mean, that you don't want to snap things off too abruptly for some countries. But I also think that it's very important that there be immediate action because government is notorious for promising things that are going to happen in the future, which, when the time comes, never happen. Uh, Perhaps the the prime example is uh, the kinds of uh, deals that were made in the 80s, that there would be a tax increase accompanied by spending cuts. Well, it turned out the tax increase was immediate, and the spending cuts came five years later. And by the time they were supposed to come, of course, everything had gone off in a different direction. But maybe the important thing is not necessarily to set a public announcement of six months, but simply begin with the, uh, say we're starting right now, and this is going to take a period of time before we're finished, obviously, uh, but then quietly start with all the things that can be broken off immediately, and the rest of them, uh, the ones that you think that require a little bit of time, put them at the end of the list. But th- that's a detail. I agree with what yeah. you said, Chuck. Uh, I think whenever, it's very whenever, well put. Whenever the United States gives money to whomever, for whatever reason, they establish a dependency by that segment. Because that segment then comes to expect for money from that from the government instead of developing its own resources to have income. Very true. So, and when you when you cut that off, you know you cause pain, you cause hurt, you cause damage. Right. You okay. you, you have a great effect on the country. Israel might be a free market today if the United States hadn't been subsidizing socialism there right. for the last fifty years. And 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 they may not be dependent upon the United States for its defense, which they may be. Mm-hmm. They may be totally dependent on their existence. May be totally dependent on our. Often infusions of money into them. Well, and of course, if America would stop uh, arming Israel's enemies, then the excuse for arming Israel well, would begin to fade away, too. You're familiar with that term, balance of power. Yeah, right. It seems like that's what the United States has been doing all over the world throughout history, is trying to balance the power so that, you know, so that people don't go to war with each other. And they you wind know? up arming both sides by right. the time they're done. right. Yeah, look at the fact that they were uh, helping Iraq during the 1980s, uh, as most people listening to the show, I'm sure, is aware. You can, aware. You can track the foreign policy failures from a need to go to war with Iraq, if there was ever a need, and I don't think there was. You can track that foreign policy error all the way back. You can There is a direct line all the way back to supporting the Soviet Union, or, or the Russia, in its revolution and to become a, you know, a communist nation. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a direct line for every foreign policy failure back to them. Because, I mean, if we hadn't have had a Russia, if the Russian Revolution hadn't have been successful, there wouldn't have been a World War II, there wouldn't have been a World War One. there wouldn't have been the Russians fighting Afghanistan, we wouldn't have been giving them millions of dollars of wheat in the 20s. The, the foreign policy failures are legion. Sure, and actually it was America entering World War One that caused the Germans, who were winning the war at the time, to, to begin to be afraid that they were going to lose the war, and so they wanted the czarist Russia government out of the war, and that it was at that point that they decided to finance Lenin, who was in exile in Switzerland, yeah, right. and let him go back to... Uh, uh, Russia gave him the arms and the things that were necessary in order to bring about the communist revolution. And, and Canada had stopped Trotsky from going back, and the United States put pressure on Canada to release Trotsky so that he could go back. Well, if you decide to run for president, Chuck, uh, I'll support you and support your policy, so keep us in, uh, advised of your campaign, and uh, we'll send money and everything else. Sure. Thanks so yeah, much. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for calling. Bye. All right, Nick in Urbana, Illinois. Says lately, I've been hearing advertisements on the radio for registration for the selective service. These aren't just public service announcements; they actually tout the benefits of draft registration, like access to student loans and government jobs. Do you have a take on this, or do you remember such advertisements being run before? You're about three times my age, so your memory probably goes back further than mine. Oh, Nick, you couldn't write an articulate email like that if you were only 13 years old, being one third my age. Anyway, uh, no, I don't remember public service announcements like that, but obviously. It does support what uh, Chandra in Utah said, that there is the smell of the draft out there, that they're laying the groundwork for it. Uh, Dave in Minneapolis says, it's difficult to argue that the U.S. should not have attacked Afghanistan in response to 9-11. But what we should do is to ask ourselves if we would still like the option of attacking Afghanistan if the roles were reversed. Uh, For example, 
uh, bin Laden was suspected of orchestrating the mass murder of Americans, so why should we be murdering Afghans if they, just because they failed to extradite Osama bin Laden? And Chile wanted uh, to extradite Henry Kissinger from America for or- orchestrating the events that led to the mass murder of Chileans. Would it have been okay for Chile to attack the United States because the U.S. failed to extradite Henry Kissinger? Very good thinking, Dave. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so stay tuned. We still have another segment to go. Well, this is our last segment, and so I do want to thank you for tuning in tonight and listening to the show, and I hope you'll do so every week. And I want to thank Scott Hartman for taking care of everything in Minnesota and making sure that we manage to stay on the air. And I want to thank the people who have sent emails. I'm sorry I haven't been able to get to all of them, and I certainly want to thank our callers tonight. I did get a nice email from Elizabeth that I think is very telling. She says, over these uh, years, have you been receiving messages from people who identify themselves as lifelong Republicans but who are shocked by what has happened to their party and so are through with the party? Well, I'm one of them, having voted first in 1960 for Nixon and for Republicans ever since. I really had believed that if and when liberty was finally lost, it would be the leftist Clinton types who would be responsible. I never, ever dreamed that the people I believed to be constitutionalists could perpetrate such cruelty on their own citizens as well as on the innocent Iraqis. Now I wonder how I ever believed that members of the Republican Party of all people cared about constitutional principles. Yet I'm experiencing a funny feeling. Now that I'm without a political party, I feel that I've grown up. What a hard way to do it. Well, that's a wonderful message. I frequently, as you know, say it is allegiance to a political party that neutralizes one's brains. And there is a feeling of great liberation that occurs when you finally say, I am not any longer going to feel that I have to vote against those bad guys, even though I'm voting for a bad guy in the process. Once you can do that, once you can say, I'm not going to vote for somebody that I don't believe in, you really do feel not just that you've grown up, but that you really are a freer individual than you were before. And this past week, I spoke at an investment conference in Las Vegas. I only had 15 minutes, but 10 of those 15 minutes were spent talking about the freedom that comes and the maturity that comes once you break free from a political party. And it's not just the Republicans, but the Democrats also. The Democrats have been promising uh, civil liberties and peace the same way the Republicans have been promising an adherence to the Constitution and a free market, and neither side delivers. And when uh, you finally break free, you are free. And not only that, you can also devote more time to yourself and your family. And that's what I want you to do this week, is to think of something you've really wanted to do for yourself and your family and do it. Because that's the place you really do have control. We'll be back next week. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much for joining me. Good night.